Hello. Hi. Um, it would be great to see your comment if you can see me and hear me. Um, hello, wherever you are. You could also put in the comments um, where you're joining from. Uh, just seeing if things are actually working. I think I think things are working my end. Can you see me and hear me? Yeah. Hi, Tara. Hi, BB. Hi, Juniper Cats. I do love that's a great name, Juniper Cats. Yes. Okay, that's great, BB. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, hi, Loretta. Hi, Cindy. I'm really well, thank you. Hi, Kanga 888. Oh, from York. I love York. I've had some great holidays there. Uh, Cheryl from Honolulu. I oh, so love to go to Honolulu. Tyler Rose. Hi, the Palm Bomb. Hi, Pauline, Maria, Anne. Hi, Ermac Rodrigo. Oh, from Uruguay. Turkey as well. We've got Ermac from Turkey. Maria from Istad. Hi, Christine. Hi, Mary. Hi. I never know. I always forget. Is it Amalia from Athens? I always forget how to pronounce your, your name. Hi, hi, Jenny. Hi, another Cindy. Hi, Old Silver. Hi, Laura. Oh, it's great. Lovely. Lots of people um, joining in. Oh, 52 people apparently online. That's really great to see. So, hello. I just want to start off um, by saying um, a big thank you to um, my channel members, um, new members, Vicky and Vicky, Vicky W and Vicky W. Um, and thank you also to uh, existing members, Kirsten, Lynn, Catherine, Teresa, Christine and Colleen. Um, for all your support. Um, it's great to have you as members of my YouTube channel and it just helps you know, support my work here on YouTube. So thanks so much. Ah, oh, Linda's saying uh, hello, uh, Claire and Tim. Tim is gigging tonight. So that's what he does on the side. He's a, a musician as well. So he's he's gigging tonight. So um, if you hear dogs and cats in the background, it's because I haven't got a pet sitter, haven't got Tim keeping an eye on them. Um, so, oh, it's great to see you. So this is another one of a, one of the video, um, a video in a series, um, my series that I'm doing on Henry VIII, which actually is a good, is complementary to the um, event that I'm doing in May, which is on Henry VIII and his six wives. And just an alert, I think there's only, I think it might be 11 places left for that. I've put the link as a kind of sticky post in the chat, but it's on claridgeway.com. So if you go to that, um, you will find the Henry VIII and his six wives event with me and other historians uh, doing talks. And in fact, if, um, if you join uh, before tomorrow evening, my time, um, then you'll be able to join in on the Zoom call that we have tomorrow, which is on Anne Boleyn. We're doing some Zoom calls in the lead up to the event. Uh, just some nice sort of discussions. It's not me talking, it's us sort of discussing uh, various topics. Oh, so many of you. Hi, the Gulf of Mexico, Kitty. Oh, Susan from Utah, Nia Sharia from Germany, Sarah from the UK, Carol from Scotland. Hi, Laurie. Hi, Dad. Uh, sorry that I'm missing or missing so many of you, Scarlett from Victoria. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, hi, Anne. Uh, so 75 of you now. Well, hello. So this one is um, an important one. Before we move on to what I suppose most people see as the more juicy topics on Henry VIII, such as, you know, his mistresses, um, the break with Rome, his health, jousting accidents, whether he was a tyrant, all those kind of uh, juicy topics. Um, we really need to look at um, Henry VIII's um, background um, just to kind of have some sort of context. Um, and that's what I'm going to be looking at today. You know, who was Henry VIII? Uh, where did he come from? How did the Tudors even come to the throne? And who made up um, Henry's immediate family? Well, 
Henry VIII was the second son and third child of King Henry VII and Queen Elizabeth of York. And he was born at Greenwich Palace or the Palace of Placentia on the 28th of June, 1491. Oh, so many of you saying hi. It's lovely to, uh, to, pop, to see you, but to, uh, to have you join me. So Henry VIII, of course, became King of England on the 21st of April 1509, um, following the death of his father on that day. Um, Henry was just 17 years old when he became king. And he actually hadn't been brought up to be king. Um, he'd been the spare until the death of his older brother, Arthur, in 1502. Henry VIII's father, the Lancastrian um, Henry VII, um, who started off as Henry Tudor, had taken the throne of England after um, his forces defeated those of King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field. And of course, King Richard was killed at the battle. And Henry VII's reign saw the end of um, the Wars of the Roses. Um, the actual final battle wasn't the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, the final battle was the Battle of Stokefield, and that happened in um, Henry VII's reign in 1487. Now, the Wars of the Roses had been a series of civil wars between the houses of York and Lancaster, um, and that this was these these sort of battles took place between um, 1455 and 1487, and they were battling for um, the throne, the English uh, throne, the crown. Both houses were descended from King Edward III. They were both royal houses, and so they both had claims to the throne. They were rival claims to the throne. And trouble really began in the reign of King Henry VI. Um, he was a Lancastrian king and he upset a few people with his pro-French policies. And he also suffered from um, poor health, especially um, mental health. And his pro-French policies and his mental health problems caused unrest in the kingdom. He was eventually... Uh, deposed and Edward Earl of March, who was the son of Richard, Duke of York, who um, Richard had acted as protector of the realm for Henry VI. Um, Edward was able to take the throne, depose Henry, uh, take the throne and become uh, King Edward IV. And I'm giving you a very potted history of the Wars of the Roses here. Um, Edward IV um, actually died suddenly in 1483 and the throne passed to his 13 year old son also named Edward who became King Edward V. Um, the boy's paternal uncle Edward IV's brother Richard Duke of Gloucester acted as Lord Protector for the boy. However it wasn't long before Richard took the throne for himself and obviously depends on whether you're a Ricardian or on the other side as to um, your views on Richard taking the throne. And little Edward and his younger brother Richard um, disappeared um, and they of course have gone down in history as the um, princes in the tower. Fate still unknown, lots of theories about them. Now, there were some who weren't happy with Richard taking the throne. And so they looked to Henry Tudor, who was the senior Lancastrian claimant at this time, who was in exile across the Channel. But who was Henry Tudor? Well, Henry Tudor had been born on the 28th of January 1457 at Pembroke Castle in Wales. His father was Edmund Tudor, first Earl of Richmond, and Edmund Tudor was the son of Owen Tudor and Catherine of Valois, Catherine of Valois being the widow of King Henry V. 
um, Henry's mother was Lady Margaret Beaufort, a fascinating lady, by the way. She was the daughter of John Beaufort, uh, Duke of Somerset, and Margaret Beecham of Bletsoe. Henry Tudor's maternal great-grandfather, John Beaufort, first Earl of Somerset, was the eldest child of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, by his mistress, Catherine Swinford. Now, John of Gaunt was the third surviving son of King Edward III. And although John of Gaunt's children by his mistress, Catherine Swinford, were initially uh, deemed illegitimate, they were legitimised, but King Henry IV, their half-brother, although he recognised their legitimacy, um, he barred them from the succession. So they did and they didn't have a claim to the throne. Now, Henry Tudor became the senior Lancastrian claimant, as I said, in 1471, and that was following the deaths of Edmund and John Beaufort and the deaths of King Henry VI and his son Edward of Westminster during the Wars of the Roses. So when Richard III took the throne, those Lancastrians and disaffected Yorkists, Yorkists that weren't happy with Richard, all turned to this claimant, Henry Tudor, and he'd been in exile across the channel um, since Edward IV had taken the throne in 1471. And in the meantime, Edward IV's widow, um, Elizabeth Woodville, and Henry Tudor's mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, hatched a plot together, uh, a plan for Henry Tudor to marry... Um, Elizabeth Woodville's daughter, her eldest daughter, Elizabeth of York. So you've got the two mothers coming together to sort of marry their children to each other. And Henry obviously liked this idea because on Christmas Day 1483 at Rennes Cathedral in France, he made a vow to marry Elizabeth. And this, this pledge to Elizabeth you know, he was Lancastrian and Elizabeth, of course, was a Yorkist. Um, this pledge enabled him to get even more support from Yorkists for his claim. Um, on the 1st of August 1485, Henry sailed from Harfleur with a force of French mercenaries and English exiles. He landed on the Welsh coast um, near Mill Bay on the 7th of August 1485. And then he set about gathering further support in Wales for his cause as he marched through Wales and the Welsh marches bound for London to fight King Richard. Henry didn't make it to London though. Um, the Richard had actually found out about Henry coming over, so Richard had set off. So the actual, the two forces, these two enemies, met on the 22nd of August, 1485, near Market Bosworth in Leicestershire. Um, as I said, Henry's forces then defeated Richard's, and a courageous Richard was killed in battle. And Henry took the throne by right of conquest. Um, so him taking the throne didn't just rely on, you know, him being a Lancastrian claimant. Um, he took the throne by right of conquest. And on the 27th of August, 1485, he entered London as King Henry VII and was crowned on the 30th of October, 1485, with his mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, being recorded as weeping marvellously, um, sort of at the proceedings. You know, she was so happy that her son, you know, was back from exile and that he'd successfully taken the throne. And he did indeed stick to his pledge to marry um, Elizabeth of York, um, he married Elizabeth of York, as promised, on the 18th of January, 1486. He was 29, and I think Elizabeth was 20 at their marriage. 
what about Elizabeth? Who was Elizabeth of York? Well, I told you a tiny bit about her. But she was born on the 11th of February, 1466. Um, we share a birthday. I'm, I'm the 11th of February too. And she was the eldest daughter um, and, in fact, eldest child of King Edward IV and Queen Elizabeth Woodville. Three years after he'd deposed King Henry VI and become King Edward IV, Elizabeth's father had secretly married um, Elizabeth Woodville, who was the widow of Sir John Grey. Sir John Grey had been killed fighting for the Lancastrians in 1461. Now, their secret marriage, you know, um, Edward marrying this widow rather than making a diplomatic match um, caused Edward's uh, mentor, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, to well, get very angry and to turn against the king. Um, this led to Edward being deposed and Henry VI being restored. However, that was only a temporary restoration for Henry. Edward soon retook the throne and actually ruled until his sudden death in 1483. Now, the marriage of King Henry VIII's parents, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, was a happy and successful one. Um, they had four children together who survived childhood. Um, there was Arthur, Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales, born in September 1486. There was Margaret, born in 1489. Then Henry, born in 1491 and then Mary, born in 1496. Following the death of Arthur in April 1502, Elizabeth of York felt it was important to get pregnant again in an effort to give her husband another son. You know, death was all around you in those days. So, you know, they'd lost one son, they'd got Henry, but they hadn't got another one. So she felt it was really important to get pregnant again. So she did. It was her eighth pregnancy. On the 2nd of February, 1503, she gave birth to a daughter, Catherine. Now, the baby girl died on the 10th of February and Elizabeth, unfortunately, died the following day on her 37th birthday. Her family was apparently devastated. Um, she'd been a constant presence in young Henry VIII's life, being in charge of her children's household and teaching Henry to read and write. And there's a picture um, from a manuscript uh, given to Henry VII, which depicts what is believed to be a young Henry VIII um, sort of with his uh, head on his arms like that, weeping on the bed um, after hearing news of his mother's death. And in a letter, a later letter to the humanist scholar Erasmus um, that Henry wrote following the death of Philip, Duke of Burgundy in 1506, Henry wrote, for never since the death of my dearest mother has there come to me more hateful intelligence your letter seemed to tear open again the wound to which time had brought insensibility. So it's clear that his mother's death had a huge impact on Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII never knew his maternal grandparents. Um, Edward IV was already dead by the time Henry VIII was born. And Elizabeth Woodville died just a year after his birth. So he wouldn't have known her. He also, of course, didn't know his paternal grandfather, Edmund Tudor, um, but he did know his paternal grandmother, Lady Margaret Beaufort. I find her a fascinating figure, um, and I would highly recommend um, the books by Elizabeth Norton, the biographies by Elizabeth Norton and also uh, Nicola Tallis on her. Lady Margaret Beaufort was born on the 31st of May, 1443. She was an only child. Her father died in 1444, so while she was still an infant, and her wardship fell to the crown. 
However, King Henry VI, who was king at the time, um, didn't keep her, her wardship. He granted her wardship to William de la Pole, who was the first Duke of Suffolk. And in 1450, when Margaret was seven years old, Suffolk married Margaret off to his son, John, who was just a few months older than Margaret. Um, this child marriage was dissolved in 1453, though, by King Henry VI, who decided that it was better for him uh, to organise a marriage between Margaret and his half-brother, Edmund Tudor, first Earl of Richmond. Margaret and Edmund married in November 1455 when Margaret was 12 and Margaret quickly became pregnant. Unfortunately for the couple, Edmund died before his 13-year-old wife gave birth to their son, Henry Tudor. Edmund had been captured and imprisoned by Yorkists. Um, he died in captivity at Carmarthen Castle on the 3rd of November, 1456. Margaret, Lady Margaret Beaufort, was a powerful lady. She was a key figure in the Wars of the Roses. She actively supported her son's claim to the throne. And in August 1485, at the Battle of Osworth Field, Margaret's, Margaret's husband, um, Thomas Stanley, I think, was he her third husband? I can't remember. And his brother swapped sides at a key moment in the battle uh, to support Henry and really did help Henry to victory. Following her son's accession to the throne, this powerful lady, Lady Margaret Beaufort, was referred to as my lady, the king's mother, and she refused to accept a lower status than the queen consort, Elizabeth of York. And in 1486, when Elizabeth, um, Margaret's daughter-in-law, was pregnant with her first child, that first child, of course, was Arthur, Margaret wrote ordinances by Margaret, Countess of Richmond and Derby, as to what preparation is to be made against the deliverance of a queen, as also for the christening of the child, which she shall be delivered. Now, these ordinances, they were like a sort of handbook that, you know, was to be followed to the letter. They set out in detail the preparations to be made for the queen's confinement, because in Tudor times, um, a queen a woman would take to her chambers for the last few weeks of her pregnancy. Um, and this was down to minuscule details. Um, the ordinances also stated how the church should be arrayed for the christening and what the child would need in his or her nursery. I think Lady Margaret Beaufort was a bit of a control freak, um, but it was important to her that, you know, this child, this prince, as she hoped he would be, and he, and he obviously was, um, would, would have a proper royal um, everything, a royal start. Now, Margaret was also a patron of education. She established the Lady Margaret's um, Professorship of Divinity at Cambridge. Um, she refounded and added to God's House Cambridge, turning it into Christ's College. Um, her estate founded St. John's College, Cambridge, and also Queen Elizabeth's School, which is in um, Wimborne Minster in uh, Dorset. I think. Um, that was founded by Margaret. She left instructions in her will for it to be founded as a free grammar school. It started off as Wimborne Grammar School and is now Queen Elizabeth's School. Margaret was the matriarch of the Tudor dynasty, and I really feel that she was a force to be reckoned with. Um, and Henry VIII would have known Margaret well, he would have known his grandmother well, because she didn't die until the 29th of June, 1509, which was a few days after his um, joint coronation with Catherine of Aragon, and also it was the day after his 18th birthday. So she'd been there for, you know, his first um, 17 years and she was 66 when she died. She'd been taken ill at Henry's coronation banquet after apparently eating signet. Um, so who knows what happened. 
But now, so that's his um, parents, his grandparents. But now let's move on to his siblings. Of course, we have Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales, Henry VIII's older brother. Arthur Tudor was born on the 20th of September, 1486. And Elizabeth of York actually travelled to Winchester in the south of England in Hampshire to give birth because it was believed that um, Winchester had been the capital of King Arthur's Camelot and that Winchester had been the um, site of his castle. Henry VII was rather obsessed with uh, King Arthur um, and the legend surrounding him. And he wanted his firstborn son. He was convinced that Elizabeth was carrying a son. He wanted his firstborn son born at Winchester um, and he would name him Arthur after the legendary king. And he believed that that son, that his prince, would um, bring about, when he became king of England, would bring about a golden age in England. He was very convinced of that. As heir to the throne, Arthur Tudor was brought up separately to his siblings. Um, in 1492, he was sent to Ludlow Castle in the Marches um, to begin his education as the future king. And on the 14th of November, 1501, he married Catherine of Aragon, or Catalina de Aragon, who is daughter of the renowned Catholic monarchs of Spain, Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon. Arthur and Catherine had actually been um, contracted to marry since 1489. Um, but sadly, Arthur died just a few months into the marriage. He died at Ludlow Castle in April 1502. And of course, this meant that his 10-year-old brother, Henry, was promoted from spare to heir. Now, as well as having an older brother, um, Henry had an older sister, Margaret. She'd been born in November 1489. Um, and then there was the younger sister, Mary, who was born in 1496. But other siblings included Elizabeth, who was born in 1492, but sadly died in 1495. Edmund, who lasted just a year, he was born in 1499 and died in 1500. And then, of course, Catherine, who I mentioned, um, the baby who lived just a few days um, in 1503. And um, her mother, Elizabeth of York had died a day after her death. Until Henry became heir to the throne, until he was uh, promoted, he was actually brought up with um, his sisters in a collective nursery overseen by Elizabeth of York, their mother. And David Starkey, in his book on um, Henry's uh, sort of early life, notes that Henry's world was shaped by his sisters, his mother, and her women. So he lived in a very sort of female dominated environment for um, until he became, um, you know, heir to the throne after Arthur's death in 1502. In June 1503, um, Henry, Henry's older sister Margaret set off to Scotland. Um, she was going there to marry James IV, which she did on the 8th of August. And in 1507, his younger sister Mary was betrothed to Charles of Castile, um, the future Emperor Charles V. But the betrothal was later broken off in Henry VIII's reign due to changes in Henry's diplomacy. And of course, Mary Tudor ended up marrying Louis XII of France in 1514, the marriage lasting just three months, I think it was, uh, ending on Louis's death. Um, Mary had managed to obtain a promise from her brother, Henry VIII, that when Louis died, that she'd be able to marry a man of her choosing. And she did. She married Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, um, who'd been sent to France to bring her home. Um, they married secretly and without um, Henry's say-so, something which angered the king. But Mary was apparently his favourite sister, his beloved sister, and Charles Brandon was his good friend. And it did help that I think they paid him in plate and money. 
and uh, so love and money kind of eased his uh, his anger and he forgave them so there's a rundown really of Henry VIII's uh, family background and his immediate family and I just wanted to do that before moving on in other live streams um, to looking at um, topics during his reign um, his mistresses, his marriages, his health and that, just because I think it's important to look at his background. So I'm just going to um, have a look at some of your questions now or comments. Oh, thank you so much, Miss Mary H. Dream, for um, the donation. Thank you. It means the world to me to have, have uh, support. Uh, so let's have a look. Yes, Dorothy, yes, the, the round table. Um, I think is the round table still can you see it at Winchester um, but yes Winchester was thought to be the the site of Camelot um, in those days that was what the belief um, was and yeah Henry VII just seems to have been so obsessed with the um, Arthurian legends Baby, poor Henry at the time. What a shock. Hey, playboy, now you're going to be king. Yeah. Baby says, I think Arthur died of sleep of sleeping sickness. I think you mean sweating sickness. Um, there, there are lots of theories as to what Arthur died, died of. Um, tuberculosis, some kind of pulmonary infection, uh, testicular cancer. Uh, there are all sorts of, of theories. Um, but I, I think sweating sickness makes sense. Um, so, yes, yeah, so what, what did Arthur Tudor die of? I think sweating sickness. And the reason I believe that is because Catherine, his wife, who was at Ludlow with him at the time, um, was also taken ill. And she was ill for quite, quite a while, actually. Uh, she worried people with her illness. So... It, it seems to me that it was a catching um, illness that um, he had. They were both ill. So therefore, I think a sort of a local outbreak of sweating sickness probably makes um, more sense. Phoebe, yes, I meant sweating sickness. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Miss Mary. Yes, Tara, I thought it was. The round table, Tara says the round table is at Win Winchester Hall. Yeah, I think I've got a photo in one of my archives somewhere. Um, but yes, Maz is saying yes. It seems so many places claim something about Arthur. Yeah, I remember as a child going to um, Boss Castle and Tintagel in Cornwall. And of course, Tintagel Castle, yeah, that's all, you know, at the time, I don't know what's said now but it was all said that that was kind of you know Arthurian as well um, yes Maz is talking about you know Winchester um, being important to Henry the seventh and yet he was a Welshman you know he his his Welsh ancestry was really important to him um as well um, so yes, it's, it seems funny that he didn't want his firstborn born like at, at Pembroke Castle or, or and rather Winchester. Sorry, questions. Christine, I wonder if Catherine's illness had anything to do with her many miscarriages. No, I think that was probably um, unrelated. Um, I, th I think she she thought off sort of something like sweating sickness. I don't I don't think Catherine actually had rather than miscarriages. She actually had stillbirths. Really, she seemed to have slightly premature stillbirths. She nearly sort of got to, to term, um, and then would would lose the baby. There are so many theories as to um, what caused it. I mean. Uh, Giles Tremlett, um, I've just been rereading Giles Tremlett's um, biography of Catherine and he points out that um, she was a very, very religious, um, like she would wear a sort of hair shirt as well, but she also fasted a lot 
and there were concerns about her fasting, mm -hmm. the fact that she wasn't eating and, and what that was doing to her health. So, you know, you kind of wonder if, if that caused um, sort of any problems. It did affect her periods, so obviously did affect, you know, her fertility. So, um, so but there are all kinds of um, theories. I'm, I'm not sure. I think she was just, we all know, I'm sure we all know um, women that have had, that have lost babies and sometimes there just isn't an answer to it. Um, but yeah, it's very sad. I think um, in an article I did for the Anne Boleyn files where I look at Catherine and Anne's pregnancies, um, I think there's firm evidence for six pregnancies, but there are, um, the there are sort of hints that she might have been pregnant more than that a couple of times. So there's six to nine, but six very firm, um, you know, firm evidence for six pregnancies. Dorothy's saying, I clicked on the little dollars meaning to donate, but it didn't tell me how to. I don't actually know what happens. I can't really do it myself. Perhaps um, Miss Mary will explain. But yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think it lets you choose an amount. But thank you, that's very kind of you. Kazu, she probably thought the fasting would bless her pregnancy. Yeah, I think I think she she did. She she prayed a lot. She went on pilgrimages. Um, you can just imagine Catherine doing everything she could to be pregnant. Party, sweating sicknesses like COVID today. I did a video, I think, on my YouTube channel about, um, you know, the similarities between them. Oh, Anne from Belfast tuning in. That's lovely. So any questions about sort of uh, Henry VIII's um, background? Tara saying, I can't remember, but did Henry VIII himself express concern over fasting? I can't remember. I can't remember whether Henry VII did. I do, I'll have to have a look, um, but I know there was concern over sort of what she, what she was doing to her body by, by her, her behaviour, by fasting so much. Um, any more sort of questions? Oh, it's so nice to know that you're from all over the world. This is really amazing so looking back we've got york honolulu um the us Istad, turkey uruguay yeah minnesota ohio athens merseyside kentucky wiltshire utah gulf of mexico germany scotland maine victoria australia florida and <laughs> tuning in in the snow a Tudor break from shoveling the snow. Oh, Virginia, Cook County, uh, West Virginia, Florida, California, San Antonio. Oh, so many. Maya saying, my maiden name was Wilts. My family came from Wiltshire and they immigrated to the US. I like to think I'm a descendant of the Berlin family lol. That's <laughs> since Thomas Berlin was first Earl of Wiltshire. Well. You, you, you could say that, yeah. <laughs> Wiltshire's a beautiful county, by the way. Dorothy said, I'm sure knowledge of Henry's coronation would have cheered his dying grandmother. Yeah, she was. She got to see him crowned. She got to enjoy the coronation banquet and then was taken ill. So at least she, you know, she saw her grandson follow on from her son and become king. She'd, she'd seen the sort of the Tudor line um, you know, secure. So um, she she she'd done her job. She'd done her work as matriarch. So yeah. Uh, upstate New York, New Hampshire. Hello from Dallas, Washington State, New Jersey, or oh, Los Angeles, California. Oh, so many Canada. Oh. Catherine's asking, why are there so many Anne's, Mary's, Margaret's and Catherine's in the English elites? Um, the, the tradition 
at the time was that a child would be sort of normally named um, after a godparent. Um, so, so you have the same names all the time because the godparents are called that and then they're called that. Then yeah, that and also because of saints' days as well, if the child was born on a certain sort of saints' day. Um, but yeah, you, because because lots of people in one um, one decade or whatever are called Anne, Margaret, Mary, and Catherine, and they act as godmother at a child's christening. They then get called Anne, Catherine, Margaret, Mary, and then they act as godparent. And so you just get that going down and down. And you've got important family names as well. Um, I'm trying to think of unusual ones that I've come across. I do like Amias, Amias Paulette. I do like that as a name. That's that's an unusual one. Um, but, uh, yeah, sort of sometimes it's an important family name. Sometimes it's just named after a saint. Sometimes they're named after, a, you know, a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. Um, but quite often it, it's to do with um, the christening service and being named after a godparent. That's Teasel down there having a shake. Do you want to come up, Teasel, and say hello to everybody? Yes. Well, you look a bit stunned. Sorry. You're a bit surprised. She's in a onesie. Aren't you ready for bed? So Teasel thought she'd just say hello to you all. Ah, uh, right, any more questions? Carolyn, Thomas Boleyn was in Henry VIII's favour at the time of his death. Yes, he was obviously high in favour because it was uh, there was even um, a rumour that he was going to um, marry the uh, king's niece, Lady Margaret Douglas. It was just a rumour. There doesn't seem to be any truth in it. But he would have had to have been in favour to have have this rumour about him. And also Henry VIII paid for some um, masses um, to be said for his soul. Now, you're not coming back up again. Um, so, yeah, he got back into uh, favour. Oh, Christine's using some doggy emojis. Oh, so is Miss Mary. She's, she's a very cute dog. Uh, how much wine did he drink daily, do you think, says Crabapple? I actually don't know um, a lot, but it probably was a bit different to our wine today. I mean, they drank. You're going to knock the microphone, sweetheart. Um, they drank ale and wine. What are you doing? You're going to get tangled up. Um because obviously the water, unless you'd got a, a spring, you know, a natural spring, the water wasn't safe to drink. So you would be drinking ale and wine and to the upper classes, more wine. I'm not sure. I haven't actually uh, trying to think if there's a book that goes into the amount of wine that was drunk at court. There probably is. But, um, yeah, I haven't. I don't know. Um, Letitia, I used to have an eating disorder. I had 10 miscarriages, one still birth. I finally had two children, one boy and one girl. They're adults now. Catherine's fasting caused her fertility problems. It could well. Be. I'm so sorry, Letitia. That just sounds awful to have gone through that. And what relationship did Thomas Boleyn have at court after the executions of Anne and George? Where he lost his, um, he lost the Privy Seal, his office of Lord Privy Seal. Um, and now I've picked her up, Teasel's being a paid. What are you doing? Um, so he lost that, um, but he did manage, he was involved in um, putting down the pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion, which of course was in late 1536. So after a while of, after a time of going, being back at Hever and I suppose licking his wounds and grieving, um, he went back to court because that he had to, because that was his job as a courtier. Um, you, you were a servant of the king, that was your job. Um, so he went back to court and 
pr proved his loyalty to the king. Um, so, yeah, so he managed to... <laughs> Dogs. He managed to prove his loyalty. Don't want to miss any questions. Dorothy, I still can't imagine kissing up to the man who killed my children. I know, but... <laughs> It's so many families ha had to, you know, you've got the Staffords as well. Um, you know, you've got Thomas Cromwell's sons, Gregory Cromwell, um, had to, um, you know, carry on after his um, father's execution. Um, you've got so many, um, so many families who's, who had a relative who was treat who was executed or who was imprisoned or treated awfully by the monarch, but you know they had to. Um, it was their career and, and it was their their family. They had to support their family. They had no choice in it. That's what their role in life was. So. Um, uh, Laurie, were there any concerns about Henry Tudor's royal lineage since a case could be made that the Beaufort line was not legitimate? Well, he, he stamped on that kind of concern by, um, by actually, he, he claimed the crown by right of conquest rather than by using his um, Beaufort claim. So it really was um, by right of conquest. Um, actually, talking about his um, lineage... Um, and going back to the whole King Arthur as well, I think Henry the Seventh actually commissioned, didn't he commission a family tree uh, to show his line right back to King Arthur, which is rather interesting. But yeah, so he he took the throne by right of conquest by beating Richard the Third, defeating Richard the Third at the Battle of Bosworth Field. <laughs> yes, we see squeeze what says says they were slightly tipsy all the time. Yeah, the, the ale definitely wasn't as strong as um, perhaps some of the, um, you know, the, the beer and lager and stout or, and that that we get today, especially not for, for children. Um, you know, you have sort of small beer. Um, but, yes, you can, you can imagine uh, wine flowing at banquets and people being under the influence. Rodrigo, did Thomas ever reconcile with Mary after Anne and George's execution? I think so. Yes, I think so. But we have no, we have no evidence because obviously that was away from court and wasn't recorded and written about. But um, you know, he he left her um, land and property, and that's so. I think so. Yes. Tyler Rose is saying that. Uh, both sides of my family have been in the US for centuries. However, my ancestry DNA is 99% English, and I absolutely love the history. Oh. Carolyn saying the polls, question mark. These were the Dulla polls that I talked about here, not the polls. They're two different families. Um, and saying, did the Boleyns get to know Elizabeth, their granddaughter? Um, there's no, obviously Thomas, Thomas and Elizabeth died within just a few years of um, the executions of Anne and George. Um, Elizabeth died in 1538 and Thomas in 1539. And there's no evidence of them actually being able to see Elizabeth between 1536 and their deaths. But they would have seen her, you know, previously when Anne was queen. Um, yeah, at, at they, they saw her at her christening, for example. Um, but yes, yeah, sadly, there's no evidence of, of any contact um, between, um, yeah, 1536 and the death, which is so sad. And there's no evidence of like Mary Boleyn having any contact um, with Elizabeth. But of course, Mary Boleyn's children um, Rose at Elizabeth's court were close um, to their cousin, the Queen, uh, served her very closely, had wonderful careers at her court. Um, let's have a look. Brendan, Henry VIII had a good hereditary claim as the grandson of Edward IV. Yeah, Henry VIII 
obviously had a really good uh, claim when he came to the throne um, because his father had been king, but he was also, yes, he, he, he'd got the fact that his mother was Elizabeth of York. So yeah, he descended from Edward IV. So yeah. Artie, did Henry VIII get on with his father? We don't actually know much about a sort of relationship between the two of them. There's, there's not, not a lot sort of written about that because, as I said, you know, Henry VIII's early years um, between him, his birth and 1502 when he became the heir, you know, were, were more he was in this sort of female environment with his mother and sisters his father was focusing on Arthur. But his father did then, um, when Henry became um, heir, his father did then um, get involved with Henry's sort of education. But I'm not really sure about their personal relationship, what that was like. Um, sorry if I'm missing anyone out. Maz, do you think if Henry VIII reigned without the Wars of the Roses? As a smell, that he would have kept the throne. People seem to rebel for less than what he did. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. Um, not quite sure. I mean, he he had to cope um, with rebellions against him. His father had to cope with rebellions against him as well. I mean, Henry VIII, his his biggest rebellion against him was um, the Pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion, which, of course, was about the um, the religious uh, measures. Um, but, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'm not really understanding your question there. Sorry. I missed Lexi's question, but Tara's saying to Lexi that Camilla isn't in crowned in her own right. She's wife of the monarch. Yes, that's right. She's um, the queen consort. Um, so, yes. Yeah, we call them queens, but um, obviously in Camilla's case, as in the case of Elizabeth of York as well, they are the they they are married to the monarch. They're not um, you know queen in their own right. Like Anne Boleyn, like Henry VIII's wives, they were all queen's consort. So they don't, they're not a reigning monarch, they're not a queen regnant like Mary the First or Elizabeth the First, who were monarchs. Um, so yeah. Theresa, so it's not a direct bloodline going back to 1066. No. No. I've, I'd have to get a family tree out to sort of work it all out. But we're talking about with the Wars of the Roses, we're talking about people um that sort of descended from Edward the Third. Trying to think of the of uh, I can't think about like William the Conqueror and down. Oh, I don't know, there probably is. I'll have to get my family tree out, sorry. Oh yes, Christine. Yeah, Henry the Seventh won the throne by conquest, yeah. Oh, Mary's saying, don't forget to click on the like button. Thank you. There, obviously, it will be a replay. If you're tuning in late, there obviously will be a replay to watch. Um, the lack of hereditary claims as RT to the throne explains Henry's obsession with having a son. They, they were all obsessed um, with having a, a son. You know, it was important. Um, you know, like Mary the First, for example, married Philip of Spain because she, she believed she... It was her duty to try and secure um, the line um, by, you know, marrying and having children. Um, it's it was your duty as a monarch to secure the succession, to have a child, and of course, at that time, um, to have a son, and actually to have sons because it was no good just having one, as was the case with, you know, Prince Arthur. You needed an heir and a spare, and preferably a few other spares as well. Um, you really needed to secure your line. Um, the these the Tudors in Henry the Seventh time and Henry the Eighth, you know, they were new to the throne, and yeah, perhaps this is what Maz meant about the Wars of the Roses. Ah, oh, yes, Maz saying the Wars of the Roses in living memory. Yes. Um, 
yes, yeah, due to the Wars of the Roses being in living memory, that's why Henry VIII was even more perhaps obsessed with having a son because he didn't want, he, if he didn't have a son, he was, his, his, his throne was more fragile. Um, whereas if he had a son, then it was more secure. So, yeah. Laura, what are your thoughts on the legitimacy of who fathered Edward IV? Um, well, I I don't go with the idea that um, that his 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 father was a French archer. I don't go with that idea at all. I do believe that Edward the Fourth's father was uh, Richard, Duke of York. Um, I haven't seen any evidence um, that points to um, him actually being the illegitimate son of of a French archer. Uh, so no, I I do believe his his father was who who he said he was. Um, Patrick, why did Anna Cleese stay in England when she didn't speak the language, etc.? She did learn English. Um, she I don't think she had an awful lot of choice about um, her location. She'd been um, given sort of. Um, in, in the sort of annulment settlement, she'd been given properties or leases of properties um, that she could use. I don't think her brother really wanted her back in Cleves. Um, she had properties that she could use in England. She had, um, you know, she had money. Um, and, you know, she had close relationships with her stepchildren. Um, I think she had a household that she could rely on um so yeah but, and but she did learn english and actually she was very close to henry the eighth after their annulment um they became very good friends maz didn't she worry her brother would kill her for the dishonor she went home i don't think he it, there was any fear of that but um yeah it would have been a difficult situation going home Ah, oh, thank you, Tara. Edward III was the time six great grandson of William the Conqueror. Thank you. I, knew, I thought there was a uh, sort of a line there. Thank you. But yes, you have got the fact that you know Henry the Seventh's uh, Beaufort line was, came from John of Gaunt and his um, his mistress Catherine Swinford, rather than John of Gaunt's wife. Um, of course, it, later the, the children became legitimised, but um, yeah, they were barred from the succession. Lexi, I think you mean Edward VI. Had Edward VI got married before his death at a young age, do you think it would have been to Jane Grey? If not, who was a viable candidate to be his wife? Um, yeah, the, the Greys... Um, I think quite liked the idea of, of Jane marrying um, the king. I mean, it was certainly something that when Thomas Seymour uh, took on her wardship, that he kind of promised them that he would um, put her forward, you know, um, that he would try and negotiate a marriage um, between his nephew, the king, and Jane. I think Jane and Edward actually would have been, um, yeah, would have got on rather well with their uh, rather zealous sort of religious um, ideas. Um, but I think probably Edward was more looking, his government were more looking to him to make a foreign match. I mean, obviously Mary Queen of Scots at some um, one point. I'm trying to think. There was a French, I can't remember who the match was. Um, a, um, a French match was um, put forward at one point. Yeah, you had the whole um, war, the rough wooing, um, with um, you know England trying to make Scotland stick to their promise from the Treaty of Greenwich that um, Edward, that Mary Queen of Scots would marry Edward. But just coming up to the hours, so just a few more questions. Yes, Matt, I think it was Elizabeth de Valois. I think you're right. Then. Um, Jane had become queen with that barred her from becoming queen pregnant. Yes, if she'd married 
Edward the Sixth, she would have been his queen consort. Um, the, she couldn't have then um, become queen a queen regnant. She would have just been the the partner of the monarch, um, and obviously any children they had would have claims to the throne. Oh, thank you, Kazu, which I think is Loretta. Love this time with you, Claire. Thank you. So, yeah, we've just come up to the hour, but I just want to say that I have put it as a kind of a pinned message, a sort of sticky uh, message comment in the chat, um, a link to clairidgeway.com, um, my author website, because I'm running um, an event which starts officially in May, on Henry VIII and his six wives with a few other historians. Um, but although it starts officially in May with the, with the historian talks, we're actually doing um, Zoom calls leading up to it. And we've actually got a Zoom call tomorrow on Anne Boleyn. We're going to be discussing um, Anne Boleyn for an hour. Um, so if you'd like to join, I think there are only 11 places left now so now's the time to register so um i have put the link in the top of the chat as a pinned um, message but if you go to claridgeway.com you'll actually see on the home page there's a link through to give you all the details the schedule and everything historians involved henry the eighth and his six wives i'm really looking forward to that and i've got a yawning dog under the table she's obviously fed up of uh, me going on and on oh thank you Lots of people saying thank you. That's really, really lovely. Um, Letitia's just saying, Jane Seymour's Catholic. How did her brothers become Protestant? I know. <laughs> because time sort of moves on, you you have people that, you know, change their religious um, views. But, yes, Edward and Thomas Seymour were very Protestant, and yet Jane um, had this um, reputation for being, you know, Catholic. Um, so, yes, yeah, some people obviously did it because it was advantageous. Other people did it because of their faith. Um, oh, Christine's using, uh, Christine's a member, so she's using her emojis. Well, I love the bee necklace one. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Oh, Patrick says he's um, joining in from Lisbon. Oh, thank you. This has been lovely. So um, I will be doing, I'll, I'll let you know when I do my next live. Um, I'm not sure what I'll do it on, but I've got this huge web diagram of Henry VIII topics that I'm going to be doing. So this is a whole series of lives. So you've got lots more of me and Henry VIII to look forward to. So I will see you very, very soon. Thank you so much for joining me. And another thank you to members of my channel for supporting me as well. It's been lovely. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.